Hello, this is Mr. Field, and this is my video on ionic bonding. Now, before you watch this, make sure you are comfortable with atomic structure, um, electron configuration, and how ions are formed. I've got videos on all of those things, so check them out if you are not confident with that. So, what's in this video? We're going to be looking at what ionic bonding is, how ionic bonds are formed, how to determine the formula of ionic compounds, uh, the structures of ionic compounds, and the properties that result from those structures. Okay, so let's start by exploring what we mean by ionic bonding. Okay, so the first idea to get into our heads is that oppositely charged ions attract each other, and there's a force between them that we call the electrostatic force. So we see that here. So in this top diagram, we've got the positive charge or positive ion and the negative ion, and because they've got opposite charges, they are attracted to each other. Okay. So that leads to the idea of the ionic bond. So the ionic bond is just the electrostatic attraction between those opposite ions. Okay. So this here is an example of an ionic bond, but it won't always just be a single positive and negative ion. We might have an example like this second one where we've got a two plus and a two minus ion. They will also be attracted. And sometimes we've got different numbers of different ions. So we might have uh, a two minus ion uh, attracted to two singly positive ions or equally a two plus ion attracted to two singly negative ions we'll look at exactly how many numbers of each ion get involved in a later slide but the key thing to take from this is that an ionic bond is the electrostatic attraction between opposite ions okay so now we know what ionic bonds are the next question we need to ask ourselves is when and why do they form so when they form is easy to answer. They form between metal atoms, which we can call M, and non-metal atoms, which we can call X. Now, we saw in a previous video that metal atoms form positive cations. And the reason why is because they lose the electrons in their outer shell to empty their outer shells and reveal a complete one underneath. Um, and we can represent that like this. So the metal atom becoming a metal cation, M+, plus, um, plus that electron that they've just lost. So in this case, up here, lithium with its one electron in its outer shell will want to lose that to form a lithium plus ion. Equally, non-metal atoms gain electrons to form anions. And the reason why is because they want to fill their outer shells. And we can represent that like this. So this is um, X for our non-metal gaining an electron to form the X minus anion. So again, in this example up here, We've got chlorine with seven electrons in its outer shell, and there's that gap there that it's going to want to complete to give it a full outer shell. So the obvious question we have now is, well, where does lithium give its electrons to and where does the chlorine get its electrons from? And the answer is simply that the, elect the, the electrons are transferred from the metal atoms to the non-metal atoms. And that means lithium, in this case, has lost its outer shell and chlorine has gained its outer shell to form these positive lithium ions and the negative chloride ions. And now we've got those two opposite charges, so they will attract and form that ionic bond. So the next two slides are going to look at how we determine the formulas of ionic compounds. Now, our golden rule is that the overall formula of an ionic compound must be neutral. That means the positive and negative charges must cancel each other out. So however many positives, we must have the same number of negatives to make sure they cancel each other out nicely. So we've got lots of examples here. I'm not going to go through them all, but if you pause and have a look, what you see is that in all of these cases, the total number of pluses and the total number of minuses cancel each other out. Now, a little tip about how we write our uh, formulas. Whenever we write the formula of ionic compounds, we write them like this without any charges in. If we do these ones here, these ones are all wrong because they've all got these charges in and we don't put the charges into formulas because they're neutral, but we do use the charges to help us work out the formulas, which you'll see on the next slide. So now we're gonna look at some practical examples of how we actually determine the formulas of real life ionic compounds. So we're gonna, use a technique called cross drop and cancel to do this and when we do this we're going to be just focusing on the numbers of the charges so like plus would be one two plus would be two minus would be one two minus would be um two and so on now 
before we start, it's worth bearing this in mind, compound ions go in brackets only when there is more than one of them. Now, what we mean by compound ions, it's these guys here, um, the hydroxide, nitrate, sulfate, carbonate, ammonium, all those ions containing more than one atom. So let's look at example one. So example one is lithium oxide. Now lithium, the lithium ion is Li plus, so I'll write that first, Li plus. The oxide is O2 minus over here, so then I write that. Now I cross and I drop first, so what I mean by that is the plus goes down there, or the, the one rather for plus goes down there. The two for the two minus goes down here, and this leaves us with this Li2, O1. Now, I need to do my cancel bit as well. That we, It's easy to forget that, but I need my cancel. Now, I don't really need to cancel anything except for we don't like seeing ones in formulas. So I will get rid of that and just leave it as Li2O, and that is my final formula for lithium oxide. What this means is there are two pluses from each of the plus ions and two minuses from the two minus ion, and so the pluses and minuses do cancel out. Let's look at example number two, magnesium sulfate. Now, again, start by writing the ions. Magnesium is Mg2+, plus, so I'll write that first. And sulfate is one of our compound ions down here, SO4, 2 minus. Okay? So I do my cross, drop, and cancel. And before we do that, it's just worth bearing in mind, we ignore that 4, that's part of the formula. We, that doesn't play any part in this um, process. So I cross and drop my charges. So the 2 from the 2 plus goes down there, and the 2 from the 2 minus goes down there to give me Mg2. And then in brackets, because there's two of them, SO4, 2 as well. Now, little thing, easy to forget, we've got to do the cancel as well. So because there's two magnesiums and two sulfates, they cancel out to leave with one of each. So I end up with just Mg, SO4. This time I don't write the brackets because there's only one sulfate. Um, and this works because we've got two minuses from the sulfate and two pluses from the magnesium. And so our charges cancel out. And let's look at our last example, calcium nitrate. So calcium is here, Ca2+. Plus. Nitrate is another one of our compound ions, NO3, 2 minus. So uh, minus, not 2 minus. So let's do our cross, drop, and cancel. We're going to cross and drop the 2 from the 2 plus and the 1 from the 1 minus. They're going to go down there to leave us with Ca1, NO3. Now there are two of them, so we put it in brackets, NO3 two like that we don't need to cancel anything as such but there is that horrible little one we don't like ones in formulas so we just go ca in brackets no3 two like that and this works because we've got two plus charges from the calcium and two minus charges from one from each of the nitrates now to wrap this video up let's look at the structure of ionic compounds now ionic compounds form what we call a giant ionic lattice we can see that here this giant ionic lattice is a three-dimensional pattern of alternating positive and negative ions. In a single grain of salt, this pattern is repeated about a million times in each direction. So what we here see here is just a tiny fragment of, of this really big pattern that we see in ionic compounds. The giant ionic lattice structure of ionic compounds is what determines their properties. So property number one is that they have high melting points. And the reason why is because melting them requires you to break the strong forces of attraction between the ions. So what I mean, for example, that positive ion is held in place by really strong attractions to the negative ions around it. And the negative ions are attracted to all the positive ones around them. And that takes a lot of energy to break those forces. Now, if we've got a, an ionic compound made from ions with higher charges, for example, two plus and two minus, those will have an even stronger attraction to each other, which will give them an even higher melting point than normal. The other property is that solid ionic compounds do not conduct electricity because the ions are not free to move. So we've got all these ions here, but they can't carry electricity because they can't move, they're locked in place. However, if we melt them by heating it, or dissolve them in water, then the ions are free to move, and so they do conduct electricity, and that leads to a process that we call electrolysis, which will be a subject of a future video. So there we are, that is the end, well done if you got this far.